Okay, thank you very much. And uh, with only a half an hour, um, what, what I really thought we could do is try to focus on mostly leiomyosarcomas and mostly the new trials because there's a number of new drugs that are out there. I thought it's important that we review some of the trials. There's been quite a bit that's come out in the last year to two, and I think uh, uh, you should be familiar with that. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started with that. Um, disclosures you've seen three times already today, so let me get started. So I think one of the important things to understand is that sarcomas represent a very diverse collection of tumors. And you have uh, literally, if you're a splitter, you could go on to about 30 different sarcomas. Um, and I, I think, you know, certainly I think this pie chart shows nicely that leiomyosarcomas and liposarcomas make up the majority. Uh, but you have a high percentage of just tumors and bone sarcomas and other soft tissue sarcomas that occur as well that are unclassified, uh, or angiosarcomas, myxofibromosarcomas, and synovioid, and, and it goes on and on. So the important thing is that there's a good pathology review. Um, your pathologist is very important in this area uh, in terms of determining that. So you see here the diversity in the histology um, and there's as we get more into targeted therapies and biologics again the same theme. It's important to understand what histology you're dealing with and what the implications are in terms of uh, the sarcoma. So in terms of incidence and outcome survival, I think you know most people are pretty familiar with the fact that uh, they, they represent a small percentage of GYN malignancies. I was just joking with Eric. I said if the projector went out, I'd be in trouble on this talk. An ovarian talk, I could literally stand up with a, with a piece of chalk and go over all the main studies and numbers uh, from memory because I've given those talks so often. So it's always a little more of a challenge to give an overview of sarcomas that, that uh, do make up less than 1% of our collective experience in terms of the number of tumors that we see. They represent only 3% of all uterine cancers. Um, and so again, a very small percentage. Uh, you see uh, less than 2 per 100,000. Uh, but they tend to be very aggressive. Uh, stage is still very important in terms of predicting how these patients are going to do. But it's frustrating, right? Because even uterine confined disease can do poorly. Um, and with, with uh, even uh, uh, really being fairly thorough in terms of looking for disease outside the uterus, they still don't do very well. So the, the chance for occult uh, uh, escape of cells is very high. Um, and it, it presents a very poor outcome. Um, adjuvant uh, treatment uh, for early stage is unclear. Um, we thought we kind of had that figured out, and it really doesn't appear that we do. We know that radiation may help, uh, again, with uh, somewhat of pelvic control, but that's all we get out of it, and in fact, not even to the same degree that we see with endometrial cancer. So uh, the enthusiasm for radiation has waned as of recently. Um, major sites of failure include uh, pretty much everywhere in the body, in pelvis, the upper abdomen, and the lung area. Uh, recurrence rate, again, is uh, um, dependent upon heter homologous versus heterologous elements, depending on uh, if it's a carcinosarcoma, and uh, I'll talk a little more about breaking all these things down here. So uh, Eric showed you the uh, mortality by histology, um, and, and certainly uh, you can see the sarcomas uh, do very, very poorly uh, as far as outcomes. And uh, the way we've classified them uh, largely is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and so the endometrial stromal sarcomas and adenosarcomas uh, tend to behave very well. The not so well, the uterine leiomyosarcomas and carcinosarcomas, and then the ugly, meaning that uh, uh, they just generally don't do uh, very well at all, even with uh, aggressive treatment, uh, or the undifferentiated and the adenosarcomas with sarcomatous overgrowth. So the endometrial stromal sarcomas, I'm not going to spend very much time on them. They tend to be low grade with uh, uh, less in the way of uh, atypia, less than 10 mitoses per 10 higher powered fields. Um, they are less likely to metastasize or recur if they're low grade. The high grade ones are much more aggressive. Um, they do metastasize more quickly. The good news is we have new targeted agents and hormonal agents and so forth that are available for these. Carcinosarcomas, um, 
it, certainly uh, we, we tend to think of these more as carcinomas, uh, frankly, in, in terms of how they behave and so forth, and they're treated as aggressive endometrioadenocarcinomas rather than as sarcomas. So I'm sort of taking these and uh, off-lifting them from the talk. Um, so you see, uh, you know, uh, IFOS and, and uh, um, cisplatinum and the carbo and paclitaxel and so forth that's used for the carcinosarcomas, which then brings us to the leiomyosarcomas. They represent about a third of the sarcomas. The Stanford criteria are still widely utilized, uh, including the number of uh, mitotic figures, the presence of nuclear atypia, as well as the presence of coagulative uh, tumor cell necrosis uh, are all important in terms of prognostic prognostic factors. Uh, we also think size and the mitotic index alone are important. Um, again, even confined to the uterus, survival for five years is about 50 percent. So we're, we're not doing very well. Adjuvant radiation has, seems to have no impact on uh, recurrence rate or survival. Uh, median overall survival with advanced or recurrent leiomyosarcoma on average is uh, less than 10 months. So not uh, very good. Uh, these are, you know, how do we make the diagnosis and how do we make the diagnosis preoperatively? It's very difficult. Even in the face of uh, what we uh, think is a rapidly expanding uterine tumor, uh, still the majority of them are in fact leiomyomas and not sarcomas. And so it makes it very difficult. Now I could give a hour's talk just on the whole morselation issue. Uh, it's come out of this and I don't know if many of you are familiar, but uh, um, uh, it's an a unfortunate case in Boston with a, a couple, of both of whom were physicians. Um, uh, he was a cardiothoracic surgeon, and uh, he has uh, been very vocal, very public um, uh, about the whole morselation issue. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, extremely sad. It really is. It's... Uh, uh, um, you know, his wife was uh, Dr. Amy Reed, who was an anesthesiologist, and, and she ended up dying um, in this uh, case. Uh, and they've been very public in, obviously, the disclosure of their medical information, but also um, they've been very critical of uh, organizations. They've been very critical of gynecologists and gynecologic oncologists and so forth. And, uh, you know, it, it, some of the things he's said have been very helpful, and, and many of them have been very unprofessional, frankly. Um, and I, as I said, I could spend an hour going through some of his quotes and so forth that um, if we applied the same standards to what goes on in cardiothoracic surgery, we could make him not look very good either. Uh, and I, I have a slide that actually does that. Uh, um, so we'll leave it at that. So what's the role of uh, doing lymph nodes and, and uh, removing the ovaries? Well, um, in terms of, you know, what we see for involvement, it's not that high. Uh, so it's about 3% um, are positive from the ovaries. And lymph nodes overall, you know, you have cases with none, and then you have cases with uh, uh, 6 or 7%. Um, if you balance the numbers, it's probably 5 6% that are positive lymph nodes at the highest. Um, and so we say, well, you don't need to ever remove lymph nodes with sarcomas. Anyone remove lymph nodes with Leiomyer sarcomas? Anybody? Okay. Well, it's interesting, right? So 5 6%, we say, ah, it's not very high. And yet, what do we do for cervical cancer? It goes from less than 1% to 3 or 4%. And we say, you must do lymph nodes. It has therapeutic benefit, et cetera, et cetera. So it's interesting why we do what we do sometimes and what the cutoffs are. Prognostic factors and survival, and so there's a lot of uh, different things. I've covered those. You can see the different survival curves. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what's, I think, old information. Let's get to how we treat these and some of the, the thoughts that are out there in terms of uh, the newer treatments and how we incorporate those. So in terms of options, uh, lots of options out there. You have gem docetaxel. Um, you have the trial looking at the BEV. You have a trial looking uh, at uh, up against uh, doxorubicin, you have, uh, should we add in some of these new agents such as bisoponib, trabectidin, or um, uh, and we'll talk a little about Olera as well, the uh, PDGF uh, agent, um, and uh, is there a role for immunotherapy? So lots to talk about. So this is the, the backbone of uh, the 
the uh, idea that gem docetaxel would be effective in this, and this was a study that was a second line, phase two. And I don't think a lot of people realize this was a 48 patient phase two trial that generated a world uh, standard of care. Um, very interesting, you usually don't see that. Um, so, you know, many of us could do a 48 patient trial in about a year and a half, and here you are uh, getting, uh, um, you know, what, what many would figure would be uh, an entire career of work to get to that level to generate a standard of care that's global. Uh, nonetheless, it's based on a response rate of uh, 27%, so pretty good. Um, and uh, these data really serve as the benchmark for comparison of any new agents in, in terms of expectations for response rate and PFS uh, that was seen here. Um, so high standard uh, stable disease rate as well. Um, and uh, in, in the second line therapy, most all these patients had been expo uh, exposed to doxorubicin prior. So uh, I think it was virtually uh, all of them. Um, so similar uh, benefit was seen if you if you move this to frontline. So this was a GOG study, uh, again looking at uh, a low number of patients, 39 patients. Um, response rate here, 36%. Uh, similar benefit is what we saw, uh, but with a higher response rate. So your response rate went from 27% to 36%. Clinical benefit rate again being fairly high. Marty Hensley uh, from Memorial uh, was the uh, principal investigator on both of these trials. Uh, so this was an EROTC retrospective review of multiple clinical trials in soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and in patients with prior therapy, chemo agents considered to be active were those associated with progression-free survival rates, 39% at 12 weeks and 14% at 24 weeks. Um, so it gives you an idea. So these, by these bars, GEM and docetaxel would be considered highly active and sort of set the, the stage for this. So that uh, was taken up by NCCN uh, and, and most other organizations. So hoping to build on the success of uh, fixed dose rate GEM and docetaxel, um, and given the modest success of BEV for treatment of other solid tumors in combo with chemo, uh, GOG-250 was launched, randomizing patients to GEM cytobine docetaxel with BEV or, or against placebo. And while it's clear that BEV did not improve response rate, it's still gratifying to see that the overall response with GEM and docetaxel in this large phase three trial were very much similar to that what was seen in phase two trials. So while we really never did a phase three trial testing GEM docetaxel, you could really look at the control arm of GOG-250, a trial that most of us have forgotten about because it was a negative trial um, to at least uh, uh, give some validity to the otherwise small phase two data. Uh, there was no improvement in PFS with the addition of BEV, um, and uh, the median was about five months. And so uh, with that, uh, then uh, really um, no role for BEV currently. So this was an interesting trial here, and this is the Geddes trial. Phase three trial looking at GEM docetaxel versus doxorubicin as frontline treatment. And uh, this just came out in, in Lancet Oncology this past year, the final results of this. So uh, again, uh, this is first frontline uh, looking at doxorubicin versus uh, pretty standard uh, doses of uh, uh, GEM and docetaxel. Primary endpoint was PFS at 24 weeks. Um, so a little bit of an odd uh, primary endpoint landmark analysis, um, and, and they looked at uh, other things as well, um, stratifying for uh, histologic subtype uh, age. So these were the toxicities. Um, as you can see, uh, fairly similar. Uh, you had more febrile neutropenia with the doxorubicin group, a little more neutropenia. Uh, you had a little more fatigue with the gem docetaxel group. Uh, more mucositis with doxorubicin. Um, of course, you have the long-term treatment effects with doxorubicin, which may or may not be of any interest in someone, with, uh, unfortunately, with leiomyosarcoma. And then this is looking at the PFS and the OS data here. So if we look at the primary endpoint of PFS at 24 weeks, you see that uh, they were exactly the same. 
no differences in the medians, no differences in the, in the outcomes there. So those curves were virtually on top of one another. Uh, and so then if you, if you look at this and break it down by, uh, you know, a number of other things, you see the uh, quality of life response rate was about 51%, but there was really no difference in the quality of life scores. Uh, between the two. So uh, if anything, the gem docetaxel was as active in terms of rhesus response. Um, and, and so uh, it was interesting because the authors concluded in this Lancet Oncology paper, which should have been heavily peer-reviewed, that doxorubicin should remain the standard frontline treatment for patients with advanced soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and that uh, gem docetaxel is not recommended as routine. Uh, and it, it generated a whole flurry of uh, editorials and so forth in, in uh, talk within sarcoma experts, so including Marty Hensley and others who are saying, are you kidding me? I would have, uh, I would have said the new standard is gem docetaxel based on these results. Um, so it's, again, all on how you interpret the data. So experts all looking at the same phase three data results coming up with very different interpretations. So I thought that was very interesting. That's why I really wanted to make this one of the focal points of the discussion this afternoon to see how you've interpreted this data because it, it certainly, I think, uh, has major implications. Um, uh, so same PFS, same OS, maybe slightly better toxicity profile for gem docetaxel. Um, so uh, certainly something to think about. Next is the phase three palette study. So this was a study um, uh, that really looked at um, turning away from bevacizumab to other antivascular agents. Um, so it evaluated the oral multikinase inhibitor pizopinib uh, in any histology except just tumors and liposarcomas were excluded uh, versus placebo. And this was a large phase three trial with two to one randomization uh, for pizopinib. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever used pizopinib. Um, I was, uh, I, I've used it in, uh, when I was in New York. Um, we, we were part of the big pizopinib ovarian uh, phase three trial. It's a fairly toxic agent despite being oral. Um, it causes a lot of uh, side effects that are uh, important and clinically relevant. So this is the phase uh, three uh, versus uh, placebo, and it's always good to go up against placebo. I think that I showed you some slides in the ovarian talk at lunch that the placebo won, or the uh, treatment won over placebo by a large amount. So if you're designing a study and you can get away with it, um, it's always good to go up against the non-active agent like placebo. So here with the vascular agent being compared to placebo, uh, no chemotherapy, there's a PFS advantage for pizopinib. Um, and, but all, all, although note that the PFS was only 4.6 months in the winning arm. So uh, keep that in mind. There was no overall survival advantage uh, uh, compared with placebo, which is interesting. So if you can't beat placebo in survival, that's not a good thing. But uh, nonetheless, um, it did lead to approval. Uh, the FDA approval for pizopinib for soft tissue sarcoma is exclusive of the GIST tumors and the lipo or the L sarcomas that were uh, um, uh, excluded from this. Um, so, you know, really, it, 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 in terms of talking to patients about this, I am biased by my uh, toxicity experience with pizopinib. The fact that the response rates were very, very low, um, if you look here, uh, uh, in terms of uh, response rate, you had a 4% response rate with pizopinib. And I don't know about you, but uh, I can usually see a 4% response rate with uh, um, pretty much anything. So it's, it's certainly, that should be almost a negative confidence interval there. And then uh, the PFS is modest at best. So uh, in terms of counseling, you know, yes, it's a positive phase three trial, but the clinical impact for me is one of not great enthusiasm. So it's something that I keep as an option for our patients with uh, leiomyosarcoma, um, but it's not towards the top of the list. And I'll sort of show you how I sort of go about it. It was FDA approved, though, as, as we noted. Uh, turning on to some of the newer agents as well, Trivectidin came on to the sarcoma scene in the early 2000s. Uh, it's best considered as a cytotoxin. It's, it's derived from a C-squirt. 
It's a, uh, a DNA uh, major groove binder, or minor groove binder, major groove bender is the way it works. It has a number of other uh, activities uh, in terms of uh, beyond just distorting DNA. It, uh, it has an immune effect, uh, changes the microenvironment, it uh, has uh, uh, effects on RNA polymerase and uh, it, the bottom line is no one knows exactly how it works because it has so many different effects uh, on the cell. So this particular trial looked at uh, randomizing uh, trabectidin um, to the carbazine in L sarcomas and uh, by L sarcomas we're talking about liposarcomas and leiomyosarcomas as a group. So now we're grouping two of the most common sarcoma groups. So we're getting up to approximately 35 to 40 percent of all sarcomas that would be included in this cohort. So uh, if we look here, you're taking trabectin against the carbazine. Again, uh, primary endpoint here was overall survival. Um, and uh, these patients were all pre-treated uh, and it was required that uh, they were previously treated with an anthracycline and iphosphamide containing regimen or an anthracycline uh, containing regimen alone plus one additional chemo agent. So these are pretty heavily pre-treated patients. You can see uh, in terms of toxicity, uh, most of it's laboratory, but it favored the decarbazine uh, in that respect. The uh we've known through our ovarian program, OVA 301 and some others, that uh, we see significant effects on liver in terms of AST, ALT. No haze laws in terms of liver failure that were invoked uh, in this study or in the 301 study. So lots of laboratory abnormalities without a lot of clinical relevance, um, but they should be pointed out. Um, so number of grade, uh, grade three, grade four toxicities that occur, um, and uh, um, uh, neutropenia led to febrile neutropenia in uh, 5% of the patients on trabectidin versus 2% on decarbazine. So this is the uh, PFS. PFS was the key secondary endpoint and showed a statistically significant difference of four months, uh, 1.5. Uh, months, uh, four months versus 1.5, so uh, favoring the trabectidin in the whole population and even uh, slightly greater in the uterine leiomyosarcoma group. Uh, and you'll recall uh, this PFS in absolute numbers and the difference is nearly identical to the PFS in bisoponib. So um, it, it gives you some idea that even these new agents are really not moving the needle as much as you'd like. Trabectidin was FDA approved for L sarcoma um, and uh, lipo and uh, lyomyo uh, after anthracycline failures in 2015. So another another phase three trial that we should address. So lots of phase three trials in sarcoma, which is interesting because up till now, um, I gave a pretty comprehensive talk in Chile uh, probably uh, three four years ago. And I was looking at all my slides then, and I had all these tables of phase two trials, and I've kicked them all out because now we have these interesting phase three trials to talk about. It was interesting because we've really moved to uh, sort of a different strategy in drug development uh, in this area. So this is another phase three, as I said, and uh, nearly simultaneously done with the last one. So rubulin is another cytotoxic, probably fitting best in an anti-tubulin family, uh, was studied in phase three. Um, and also for the L-sarcomas, uh, also with the carbazine as the active comparator. In this case, the randomization was one-to-one. -one. The primary endpoint, again, was overall survival. They looked at PFS as well. And you can see here the PFSs um, were not very good. So 2.6 months uh, in both arms. Uh, overall survival, 13.5 versus 11.5. There's a two-month uh, overall survival advantage for rubulin over decarbazine. Uh, um, similarly, there's no difference in objective response rate, uh, with again, a very low objective response rate, 4% versus 5%. So these are agents that have made it all the way to phase three, and you're seeing response rates of 4 and 5%. Think of the, the millions and tens of millions of dollars that's been spent on these trials. 
Um, again, overall survival, uh, just, this is very much like the trabectidin versus the carbazine phase three. There is a pre-planned subset analysis in here. There was no OS improvement in leiomyosarcoma. Uh, all the benefit was seen in liposarcoma. So FDA approved this only for liposarcoma. Um, so it, it's not uh, uh, available. NCCN included it for leiomyosarcoma. Um, but it's probably an error if you go back and look at this data critically. So, um, evofosfamide, people are constantly looking for a, a better ifosfamide due to the toxicity and the difficulty of giving it. Um, it's a hypoxia-activated prodrug of ifosfamide and it was given in combination with doxorubicin versus doxorubicin alone. And this, again, is in uh, first-line uh, treatment for soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, study was completely negative. Um, the uh, evofosfamide was more toxic and no better than single agent uh, doxorubicin. So, again, um, interesting data. Uh, this just came out in Lancet Oncology this past year as well. So, these are high impact uh, journals uh, uh, publishing all this uh, flood of uh, sarcoma data that, that has just come out in the last year. This is the Picasso study, this is uh, um, another IFOS better study, if you will. Um, this is looking at palophosphamide plus doxorubicin. Um, and, and again, this is uh, a metabolite of doxorubicin that avoids a lot of the downstream uh, toxic metabolites that you would see. So the thought process is that you would have a much better toxicity profile and perhaps be able to push the dose. Uh, of this over, over ifosfamide itself. Um, nonetheless, uh, you see that uh, uh, overall survival uh, uh, was not improved. Um, PFS was uh, slightly improved. Um, no big differences uh, in anything else, and if anything, it was more toxic. So um, higher response rate, no, uh, no improvement in PFS OS. Um, so again, doxorubicin wins. So this is a phase three trial of a doxorubicin versus investigator's choice in, in relapse. And uh, it, uh, again, a prodrug um, that binds to albumin and uh, localizes to the tumor. Um, in an acidic tumor microenvironment, the doxorubicin is supposed to be released. Uh, and this is a random, uh, randomized trial again. So. Um, this is built off a randomized phase two, suggesting there was uh, some superiority for the for the ALDOX. Uh, and it, this was presented uh, last year at ASCO. Um, and you can see here uh, that uh, that uh, in terms of uh, the L sarcomas, uh, you see um, uh, survival 5.3 versus 3 um, w was uh, favoring the aldox or rubicin over investigator's choice. Um, response rate uh, was superior um, and uh, significantly higher for L sarcomas uh, with more toxicity that was seen as well. So this could be something that works out to be a doxorubicin alternative. So keep your eye on this aldox or rubicin. Um, and uh, as I said, this data just came out this past year. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see uh, if we can ameliorate any of those toxicities. Uh, it's it's uh, pending for FDA. There's a Span Spanish randomized two study which rejected in doxorubicin, and I think I'll I'll skip this um, um, data just in the interest of time here. So uh, another strategy is to uh, look at doxorubicin plus uh, alaratumab. So um, uh, we've seen a number of uh, uh, combinations. Uh, the alara is a monoclonal antibody against uh, PG, uh, PDGFR, so platelet-derived growth factor alpha. Um, and uh, uh, it has looked fairly promising if we look here at the uh, toxicity profile, it's uh, obviously more toxic in terms of uh, neutropenia um, and fatigue. Uh, but uh, in terms of outcomes, uh, there was a numerical increase in PFS of about two months. Um, it did not achieve statistical significance. 
so uh, there's still quite a bit of interest uh, in, in doing this, but uh, uh, based largely off the fact that uh, there was an improvement in OS that you can see here. So you're looking at uh, 26.5 versus 14.7 months. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this different differed than the randomized phase tr two trial, which did not show a difference in OS and had shown some difference in PFS. So a little hard to know what to do with these numbers. Um, and uh, uh, the phase three is done, and the FDA actually approved it um, in use with doxorubicin uh, this past year. So a lot of activity with trevectidin coming online, bazopinib coming online, alara coming online, arubulin coming online. Uh, all in the last uh, two years, so uh, quite, a, quite a few changes. Um, will there be targeted therapies for uterine leiomyosarcoma? I think I'm backing up on my time here. So uh, short answer is that uh, we have not come upon any single mutations that appear to be driver uh, that are great candidates for targeted therapies. Immunotherapy may be an option. Uh, Eric talked about the role of immunotherapy in, in GYM malignancies as a whole. This is looking at in sarcomas. Um, and uh, so there's phase two NEVO data out there. Uh, not very exciting. This is what we know so far. Pembro, uh, not very exciting. In leiomyosarcoma, zero of ten uh, objective responses. Um, what about if you do combination? Um, eh, still doesn't look very good. Here's this Pembro with cyclophosphamide, uh, zero percent response rate. But this looks a little more promising, and that was uh, Nevo plus Nevo plus Ipi. So um, this is a randomized phase two that was presented at uh, ASCO this past year. Um, and the Nevo Ipi arm was followed by uh, Nevo. Um, thereafter to progression. So if you look at the single arm there on the panel on the left in the orange, you see the Nevo and the waterfall plot's not very uh, not very impressive, but it does become more impressive when you add the IPI in. Um, so the overall response rates are very modest, certainly with single agent Nevo, uh, although Pazo again and, and some others are 4%. Trab and the Carbazine have response rates of about 10%. So, by the way, trabectidin was about 10% on that study, uh, to give you a comparison. Um, but the, uh, uh, I, I think that the, there's some promise here based on the early signals, but again, small numbers, and, and we have to wait and see. These are the PFS rates uh, that are modest at best, and even at the upper limits of the range, they're fairly short. Um, so even if you look, uh, you know, where they, where they stand, um, 2.1 versus 4.4 months, uh, um, nothing that uh, is earth shattering here um, as we move on. So um, just wanted to wrap up with uh, uh, sort of uh, what I've taken as the, the approaches. This is sort of my opinion and based on a couple of other uh, thought leaders as well. Um, as to what people are thinking. So it, most people are, are doing um, uh, doxorubicin with uh, Olera um, or one of the other agents uh, that I have paired there. Uh, G1 oncologists uh, usually do gem docetaxel first, uh, followed by um, doxorubicin and, and now in the U.S. usually Olera. Uh, but you could do doxorubicin alone, or you could do doxorubicin uh, with ifosfamide as the next step. And then that sort of leaves, uh, in the GYN onc world, trebectidin is, uh, or pazopinib is next up, um, or uh, some of the other drugs that he hadn't used above. Um, and uh, if, you're, if you're down to the carbazine and arubulin, you're probably stretching uh, if it's a leiomyosarcoma. Um, so uh, it's just sort of uh, some notes as to, to how you order it, uh, uh, these drugs. So uh, new staging systems, not all that new anymore since 2009. Uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma, uh, we do have active targeted therapies that are available for that. And with uh, uterine leiomyosarcoma, uh, the, the uh, risk for death remains very high. Um, it's, it's exciting to see that uh, pharmaceutical companies are investing in uh, trying to do um, uh, good work in this area in terms of clinical benefit, but we really, I don't know have, if we've really realized a lot of gain in terms of PFS or OS based on the data I've shown you. 
Uh, but it does give us more approved options, which is good. We used to run out of options very, very quickly. The bad news about many of our sarcoma patients is they don't get much beyond third line anyway. They deteriorate in terms of function fairly quickly, and that becomes a problem. And, and we talked about the role of radiation. So thank you very much, and again, thank you so much for having me in Saudi. Thank you.